We'll welcome everyone who's already signed on. We're just going to give it a few more seconds just to uh, let some last minute attendees uh, finish logging in and then we'll begin the presentation. All right, well, again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, today's webinar is going to be data logger basics for building performance monitoring. My name is Shannon Ryerson, and I am a technical sales representative here at Onset. I specialize in data logging selection and application support, and my primary market is building performance monitoring. Just a few housekeeping notes on the webinar today. This webinar will run for approximately 50 minutes and we will try to save a few minutes at the end to uh, answer any questions that may have coming up during the presentation. You can type your questions into the question selection of the control pane. And uh, just a heads up as well, this webinar is being recorded and a link to this recording uh, will be sent to you in a follow-up email uh, after the presentation. So just an overview of Onset, we are the makers of the Hobo data loggers. Our sole focus is on data logging and monitoring. Our company was founded in 1981, and we are located in Bourne, Massachusetts on beautiful Cape Cod. We are a lean manufacturing operations, and we're also ISO 9001 2015 certified. Uh, the picture you see here is actually our facility in Bourne. Uh, this is where our sales team is, uh, production, um, software development, engineering, marketing, um, all reside in here. So just an overview of what we're going to cover today in the presentation. Uh, what is a data logger? Some common uses for data loggers. Uh, indoor measurements you can take with our data loggers. Uh, data access options why use data loggers, uh, some frequently asked questions that we get, and then as well as uh, saving some time at the end to uh, answer any questions you may have. So before we begin, I always like to get a good feeling of uh, who in our attendance has experience with uh, data loggers. So what we like to do is just start out with a quick poll before we get uh, into the presentation. All right, great. Well, it looks like we got a good mix in attendance today. Uh, I'm happy to see that 64% of you are currently using uh, Hobo data loggers. Uh, looks like we have 10% of you who are using a, uh, another type of data logger, and 25% uh, of our attendees have not used data loggers. Uh, so hopefully from this presentation, uh, there's something that uh, everyone can take away from it. All right, so what is a data logger? A data logger is essentially an electronic instrument that records measurements at a set interval over a period of time. Uh, typically, these devices are compact, battery powered, and equipped with an internal microprocessor, data storage, as well as one or more sensors. Data loggers can be deployed in indoor, outdoors or underwater environments, and they can record data for up to years at a time, typically unattended. With data loggers, you typically get two types of data loggers, and those would be an interval logger and a state data logger. An interval data logger will read the input at the selected sample time and store that reading in its memory. It essentially records at an interval whether or not that data value has changed. And these data values can be anything. So 50 degrees, three degrees, 19 and a half degrees, uh, you know, 20 PPM, 60%, et cetera. 
State data loggers operate a little differently. Uh, these check the state of the input every second, and then the logger will record that change of state and time and date stamp that recording. Um, and it essentially records two states, uh, zero or one. These also count as pulses. And here is an example of uh, what data files will look like from an interval logger versus a state data logger. As you can see with the interval logger, it records at its set interval and marks those points along a line graph. For a state data logger, again, it only has uh, two states, either you know high logic, low logic, on, off, or pulses. And as you can see, those are representative in the graph below. So what are some common measurements uh, that are taken with data loggers? Um, essentially for uh, indoor environmental uh, monitoring, it would be temperature, relative humidity, um, CO2, air velocity, VOCs. Uh, for energy, we have a few different options for monitoring that, whether it's monitoring uh, power consumption at a plug load, kilowatt hours, kilowatts, watts, amps, power factor, uh, ACDC, current and voltage, uh, differential pressure if you're monitoring inside trend rooms, uh, gauge pressures, four to 20 milliamp signals if those are coming off of a piece of equipment or a third party sensor, uh, pulse signals from something as like a, um, a contact closure or an electronic switch. Uh, also, we have the ability to record DC voltage signals in specific ranges, you know, zero to 2.5, zero to five, 5, 0 to 10, 0 to 24. Um, also, tilt and acceleration if you're interested in monitoring, you know, whether a vent fan is open or closed or, or when that event is happening. And then also we have uh, time of use data loggers, you know, so light on and off, motor on and off, uh, state change of a logger, and then also uh, occupancy loggers with light sensors built into them. So what are some common uses for data loggers? And essentially this uh, this graph illustrates the different areas that you can deploy and uh, monitor data. So whether it is, uh, you know, occupancy and light measurements um, in an office setting, you know, say you have conference rooms that are on, um, have automated lighting controls where someone walks into a room and the lights automatically turns on. And if it doesn't detect motion for uh, a set period of time, those lights would automatically shut off. Um, also within hospital settings, if you need to ensure your uh, your patients or your clients are uh, in a comfortable environment, you can monitor temperature and relativity or humidity there. Um, also in you know uh, factory production settings where you need to uh, ensure you got good air quality and want to monitor you know CO2 with temperature and relative humidity. Um, also, we have some outdoor options for doing field condi conditions such as temp, RH, soil moisture, soil temperature. Um, another example of outdoor data logging would be uh, water quality or water level monitoring if you work at like a waste management facility. And, you know, not only do you need to track your uh, indoor environmental conditions, also, you know, what uh, what the temperatures of your discharge are, uh, your wastewater discharge, and if there's uh, any particulates that are outside of uh, your state's uh, requirements. And then also we have options uh, for remote field monitoring conditions where essentially, uh, you know, the data is collected and pushed up to a cloud-based platform, uh, which we'll touch base in a little bit. Um, and again, another nice thing about all of our data loggers is that these are battery powered, so no need to worry about finding uh, an external power supply um, to be able to run our loggers. Most of our loggers will run off batteries for two years, you know, one to two years, some of them even up to five years without needing those batteries to be changed. Um, essentially, our data loggers are uh, desirable to be deployed anywhere where the convenience of uh, battery power is preferred. 
So why use data loggers and more essentially why use uh, Hobo data loggers? Well, our data loggers are fast and easy to, to, to deploy. We offer a wide uh, array of measurements that you can take with our data loggers. Uh, they're what we like to call toolbox portability, which essentially means that, you know, they're small and compact enough where you could put them inside a toolbox. Some of our data loggers are even small enough where you can fit them right, uh, right into your pocket if needed. Um, also gives you the flexibility to access your uh, data over a few different mediums. Um, Onset also has responsive product delivery and support. And also our products are coming in at a low cost, but also maintain a very high accuracy. So how do you use a data logger? There's really just five easy steps to operating uh, Hobo data loggers. Essentially, you need to download and install uh, software on a mobile device or laptop. From there, you would connect to the data logger and launch its parameters. After that, you'd place the, the data logger in its deployment site and record data for a period of time. At the end of the deployment, you simply reconnect the data logger to a mobile device or laptop. And then you download the data file from its device, read out and analyze it uh, with our software, or you can also use third-party softwares that accept uh, CSV or XLS file formats. Uh, our data loggers uh, do have uh, a variety of logging intervals you can set them to. And essentially our data loggers can log as fast as once a second or as slow as once every 18 hours. And you can choose any variable um, in between those two thresholds. Uh, you also have the ability to set start and stop times on them. So if you want them to start at a specific time and date, and then stop at a specific time and date. You can configure it to do that. And then also uh, we have options for what to do in the memory fills. It can either go into wrap mode where essentially it starts overwriting over its oldest data, or you can stop it when the memory fills up on it. So we have a few different ways that you can access the data from our loggers, uh, USB loggers, Bluetooth loggers, and web-based loggers. And essentially our Bluetooth data loggers can be part of a remote monitoring solution. And we'll touch base on that in a uh, few slides. First though, we will talk about our USB data loggers. These are ideal for short, short term trend logging with manual offload. And to use our USB data loggers, you simply connect a USB uh, mini B cable to a computer to configure and launch the device. From there, you would secure it at its deployment site. At the end of its deployment, you download the data to our Hobleware software, where you can then process that data, analyze it, and present pre uh, presentation grade reports. And here are a few example of some of our uh, USB data loggers for uh, indoor applications. Um, and I'll go off of these from uh, the top left uh, to the right. The first option is our MX, I'm sorry, UX011A uh, temperature and relative humidity data logger. Um, that essentially will record temp and relative humidity. And as you can see, you get a nice LCD readout screen and that will show you what its current temp and RH reading is. Also gives you a memory status indicator as well as a battery status indicator. From there, we have one of our uh, Hobo state data loggers. Um, again, this just will record when there's a change of state or an event or also pulse data logging. So this can be used in a wide variety of applications, um, whether you connect it to one of our kilowatt hours monitoring kit to record uh, kilowatt hours or kilowatts on a panel. Um, it can also be used to connect it uh, to a piece of equipment that may have some type of relay on it. Um, to determine when that relay is open and shut, or also uh, if you have a piece of equipment that has um, a relay that goes from a low uh, logic state to a high logic state, that will also record uh, when that happened. Next, we have our plug load data logger, um, which I commonly see these used in office settings. Um, essentially what they do is go in line between the wall outlet and um, uh, one of your employees' desks. Uh, these can handle up to a, uh, 15 watts of uh, continuous power and really will give you all the parameters you need um, to record for energy, such as volts, amps, watts, watt hours, uh, kilowatts, and power factor. 
Um, from there, on the bottom left, we have uh, a picture of one of our occupancy and light data loggers. This essentially will tell you when someone was in the room and how long those lights are on. And it's good for if you're trying to determine, you know, if your um, automated controls are working. So you can see when it shows if someone was in the room versus when the lights came on and off, just to make sure that your automation is operating correctly. And then lastly, at the bottom right, we have our uh, Hobo four channel thermal couple data logger, uh, which is ideal for recording, you know, higher temperatures or extreme low temperatures, um, you know, such, a, such as if you're monitoring, you know, maybe burner temperature or steam pipe temperatures. Uh, very common application is actually using it for concrete curing uh, for the simple fact that you could stick in the concrete, monitor the temperature as it cures. Once you're done monitoring that, you simply just cut the cable, resaw to the end, and now you're good to go on uh, to the next monitoring project. And here are just some examples of some of our USB data loggers in action. Um, again, the top left one is one of our thermal couple data loggers. Uh, with this one, it looks like they're using it inside of some type of a high heat incubator. Um, we also have uh, showing one of our temperature and relative humidity data loggers uh, with an external probe on it that's being used to monitor uh, an environmental chamber. Bottom left is showing an example again of one of our uh, occupancy and light data loggers, which again will show you uh, when people were in the room and how the light, long the lights were on and off for uh, versus when the uh, occupants were in there. And then lastly, um, on the bottom right-hand corner is one of our more po uh, popular uh, data loggers, and it's actually our motor on and off data logger. Uh, this one becomes very convenient if you're trying to monitor um, electric monitor, uh, electric motor usage, say on like an HVAC system or a compressor or a pump or something like that. Uh, essentially, there's four rare earth magnets on the back of that data logger. You simply magnetize it to uh, the motor casing. You put it into a calibration mode, which essentially determines uh, what that AC magnetic field looks like when the motor's on versus when it's off. And then every time the motor comes on and off, it will give you a totalization of its runtime and when that motor had come on and off. Next, I'd like to go over uh, some of our Bluetooth data loggers. And uh, Bluetooth data loggers are essentially wireless uh, data loggers that you can access uh, via a mobile device or uh, a Windows-based laptop. So when using a, uh, uh, one of our Bluetooth data loggers, you will need to download our free uh, Hobo Connect app to either a mobile device, uh, such as a smartphone or tablet, or if you have a Bluetooth enabled laptop, we do have a desktop version for that. And essentially you just need to get within 100 feet line of sight from the data logger uh, or data loggers and any loggers that are within that range, you'll see populate on the screen. And then you just tap on it to connect to it, to do your configuration as well as data offload. Um, within the app, we do give you the ability to look at that data in line graph, uh, line graph form. And also there's some other um, neat tools on there, like being able just to check the current status of the data logger, what its current reading is, you know, uh, memory capacity, battery life, uh, things of that nature. And uh, again, this is available on either iPhones or Android-based uh, devices, as well as Windows-based uh, laptops or computers, as long as they're Bluetooth enabled. And here are just some screenshots of our Hobo Connect software. So essentially on the left-hand side is showing you its connection screen, uh, where you can configure the logger, read out the data from it, uh, page a logger, if for some reason you can't find one, a lot of our loggers do have a paging off uh, option where you press that and it will uh, set off an alarm for a few minutes to help you find it. Um, within the, the software, again, we do have uh, graphical um, readouts where you can view that data in line graph form and also export that as a PDF file. And then we also give you the ability to share these data files um, via either XLS, uh, CSV, text file, or uh, a hobo data file. 
Um, CSV, XLS, uh, you can use those to import into Excel or any other program that accepts those file formats. And with the Hobo file, that would actually allow you to uh, import it into our Hoboware software if you prefer to use that um, for your data analysis. And here are some of our common uh, Bluetooth building performance data loggers. Uh, the top left is our MX1101, which is a temperature and relative humidity data logger. Uh, this is a very popular data logger uh, for museum settings, preservation houses, um, anywhere where you need a low profile data logger but need to take highly accurate temperature and relative humidity readings. Uh, the top right is our MX100 temperature data logger. Uh, this one just does temperature only. Um, it does not have a replaceable battery, but you will get a few years life out of that uh, before the battery dies. But essentially after that, um, it is considered a throwaway device. Uh, bottom left-hand cor corner is actually uh, one of our pendant temperature and relative humidity, I'm sorry, temperature and light data loggers. So essentially this uh, one device will record uh, both temperature and light readings in either uh, lux or lumens, depending on how you, you configure it. Um, and then lastly, we have our MX1102A uh, carbon dioxide temperature and relative humidity data logger. And again, essentially this will record carbon dioxide, temperature and RH. Uh, this is one of our more unique data loggers where this one is actually Bluetooth enabled as well as being USB enabled. Uh, that becomes beneficial if you're ever working in um, you know, a facility where they may not approve uh, Bluetooth enabled devices, but you still need to record carbon dioxide. You can always use our um, Hoboware software to be able to configure this data logger as well as offload the information from it. And here are two of our newest build, building performance uh, data loggers, which fall under the MX1100 series. Uh, the first one is our MX1104 uh, Bluetooth uh, temperature, relative humidity, light, and analog data logger. Um, this one essentially has a built-in temperature sensor, relative humidity sensor, and light sensor. It also has a fourth analog channel, which you could connect uh, one of our self-describing sensors to, which we will uh, cover in the next slide. Um, and then we also have our MX1105 uh, four-channel analog data logger, which essentially, uh, with it being a four-channel analog data logger, it allows you to connect up to four of our self-describing sensors to it. Uh, these, these particular data loggers are compatible uh, with existing U or UX series sensors. So, um, for example, anyone out there who's used Hobos and have used our ux 12006 m uh, four channel analog data loggers, all those sensors are still compatible with this. Uh, we do offer a whole new suite of self de uh, describing sensors for these data loggers that will give you a wide variety of measurements uh, that you could take. Uh, we did improve the, uh, improve the IP rating on these over our previous uh, analog data loggers where they are splash proof with an IP54 design and they can also store up to 1.9 million measurements uh, before the memory fills up on them. These data loggers simply take uh, two AAA batteries and you'll get about a year's life out of these batteries uh, if you're setting the logging interval to uh, one minute logging or greater. And again, here are some additional measurements you can take with those MX1104 and MX1105 data loggers. So we do have temperature sensors for them. Um, with our MX1104, you have temperature and relative humidity, which our Hobo Connect software can actually calculate dew point from that. Uh, you know, there it was the, the MX1104 that had the light intensity sensor built into it, where you could see that data displayed in either, either Lux or Lumens. We do have AC current sensors available for these um, in a wide variety of ranges, uh, 2 to 20, 5 to 50, uh, 10 to 100, and then 60 to 600 amps. Uh, you also have the ability to connect both AC and DC uh, voltage sensors to it. Uh, we do have DC current sensors available. Uh, also, you have the ability to connect uh, differential pressure sensors to it, air velocity sensors to it, uh, compressed airflow, gauge pressure, um, as well as 4 to 20 milliamp. Um, 
some key advantages to having those DC voltage and four to 20 milliamp input adapter cables is a lot of times we may not have the exact sensor that you need for your project at hand. Uh, but a lot of third party sensors do output an analog signal such as uh, you know, a four to 20, a zero to five DC voltage. Essentially, you can connect those uh, sensors to our devices with the appropriate input adapter cable. And then it's just a matter of setting up the scaling of you know, what the sensor's reading versus what that you know, four to 20 or zero to five DC voltage signal, signal represents to its reading. And again, this just will widely. Uh, this just allows you a great, greater flexibility in the measurements uh, that you can take uh, with our data loggers. So with our self-describing sensors, uh, we do have uh, sensors that will record air, water, and soil temperature rating. We also have some food grade uh, stainless steel temperature sensors. So if you're in the food industry and you need something that is, you know, uh, 316 rated because you're using it for testing meat products, uh, we have those available. Uh, we also have some sensors that are designed to be mounted to a pipe or flat surface. Um, Another good example for that would be um, uh, monitoring temperature on windows. We see that a lot in building performance just to see how hot the windows are getting and versus how much of that radiant heat is coming into the building. And again, with our self-describing sensors, we have options for monitoring AC current, DC voltage, as well as four to 20 uh, milliamp inputs. Unlike our old U and UX uh, sensors, our self-described sensors have built-in electronics into them. And essentially what that means is when you plug uh, the sensor into the data logger, it's automatically going to rec recognize if it's a temperature sensor or if it's a, you know, a split core CT sensor and also what range of CT that is. Um, and another benefit just from some asks we've heard from our clients over time is that these new self-describing sensors do have a locking mechanism on them. So essentially you plug the sensor in, give it a quarter turn, it locks it in place so it's less apt to get uh, pulled out if um, someone was to accidentally you know, put a little too much strain on it or sometimes just over time from plugging and unplugging something, it can wear out a little bit causing it to not make a good connection. Uh, this alleviates some of those issues. So as I mentioned before, um, our Bluetooth data loggers can become part of a remote monitoring system. And that is with the introduction of our MX gateway. And uh, the MX gateway essentially provides near real time measurements uh, to a Hobolink dashboard. Uh, from there, you can actually program alarms in the data loggers, you know, so for temperature, relative humidity, you could set high or low thresholds. And if one of those data loggers is to go outside of those user-defined user settings, uh, you can receive um, an email or text alarm notification letting you know that one of those sensors has gone out of range. Uh, you can also set up uh, system alarms if a logger was to go missing, was to stop logging, low battery things of that nature. Um, just like with the mobile app, the gateway or the loggers, I should say, do need to be within a hundred feet line of sight range for the gate from the gateway in order for the gateway to pick up those Bluetooth packets from it. And up to a hundred uh, data loggers can't connect to a single gateway. Um, so, you know, in a, say like a wide open uh, warehousing situation, um, this may become beneficial for you. Uh, the gateway itself is Wi-Fi and Ethernet enabled, um, so you can either connect over a Wi-Fi setting or plug an Ethernet cable into it to get that internet access. Um, if you do use if, if, uh, Ethernet, we do offer PoE for that, which essentially is just power over Ethernet. If you don't have that available, they do ship out an APC power supply. And also um, all MX uh, series data loggers are uh, compatible with the MX uh, gateway. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, some of our uh, web-based solutions, which essentially would be our RX remote monitoring stations. So the RX stations provide remote access to uh, site-specific environmental data uh, anytime, anywhere through the internet. And these can be deployed both uh, in indoor and outdoor settings. Uh, with this being cloud-based, you have direct access to your data through uh, Holbolink, which essentially will give you 
24-7 web access to your data through a web browser. Um, again, with it being cloud-based, that means you'd have access to it through a computer, a laptop, a tablet, um, even a smartphone. Uh, if you um, needed to do a quick spot check on uh, the status of your systems, um, Cobol Link does give you the, abil the ability to verify that uh, the system is up and running and everything's connected uh, through Hobo Link with our RX stations, you can set up and manage alarms uh, directly through our cloud-based platform. Um, also, it gives you the ability to schedule uh, automated delivery of data. So for example, if um, you know, you're a building manager and you need a, a daily or weekly report of you know, uh, temperature processes or um, you know, just any, uh, any measurements that you're taking in your plant, uh, you can set it up where it will automatically deliver you this data either on, you know, a daily, weekly, monthly schedule, however you configure it. Um, similar to our gateway, you are uh, you can set up user-defined alarms where you can uh, receive notifications via text to email if uh, a sensor is to go outside of those user-defined settings. This also does give the ability to uh, set system alarms. So... Uh, you know, if the gateway misses a connection or, you know, one of our uh, remote uh, remote wireless sensors goes missing, um, you can receive notifications on that. And with these devices, we offer them in both uh, cellular, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet options. Uh, these devices can be configured with only one of those forms of telemetry. Um, so, you know, for example, with our RX, if you choose our RX 3000, if you choose a cellular, um, it's only going to be able to connect to the internet over cellular, regardless if you have Ethernet or uh, Wi Fi available. Um, same with Ethernet or Wi Fi. If you choose one of those options, you know, you, you're, you're limited to uh, that connection to the cloud. So with using our uh, web-based system, we do have uh, what we call our HoboNet wireless sensor network. Um, this wireless sensor network, uh, these sensors give you ranges of about 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet line of sight um, back to the RX station. Uh, these are scalable and up to 50 wireless sensors can connect uh, to a single RX station. Um, and again, with the RX station, you do have remote access to the data and the current conditions. Uh, you also have the ability to set up uh, dashboards within HoboLink if you know there's any particular uh, sensors that you maybe want to keep a close closer eye on, or if you're running multiple stations, you know you can group sensors together um, if you want to have uh, better visibility to what's going on in a specific area um, or at a specific time. Um, and also you do have, again, the ability to set alarm notifications uh, when uh, conditions reach those uh, user set thresholds. Um, with this being a uh, mesh network that these wireless sensors form, essentially what that means is if uh, a sensor is out of sight or out of range from the RX station, it can uh, essentially pass its signal through other sensors in line, making up to five hops to get that signal back to the RX. So with our HoboNet sensors, not only are they sensors, they actually act as repeaters as well. Um, and I just wanted to point out uh, on the right hand side, right below the RX unit is actually one of our indoor temperature and relative humidity sensors uh, that does run off of two AA batteries and the temperature and relative humidity sensor reside in that little white piece that's coming out of the bottom of it. Um, these are weatherproof. So if uh, you work in an area where they do any type of spray down or wash downs at night, um, you don't need to worry about damaging it. You know, getting it wet's not gonna hurt it. The only thing you can't do is take it and submerge it. So from here is actually an example of uh, one of our dashboards within HoboLink. And like I said, any, um, like I said earlier, uh, you can have multiple RX stations or group RX stations and gateways within one HoboLink account. And you can then set up dashboards uh, where you can pick and choose sensors or specific data loggers and group them together uh, within a dashboard on a specific widget. Uh, and widgets are essentially uh, the graph, the graphic that you want to see this da data displayed in. So whether it's a line graph, uh, 
thermostat, biograph, pedometer, speedometer. We also give you the options to choose uh, just the text data uh, to view that information. So dashboards can get very hand uh, become uh, very useful if you're trying um, to keep specific uh, measurements in one localized area for just doing quick spot checks or something like this. The dashboard really helps out with um, with that data management. Also within HoboLink, and this becomes very beneficial for uh, larger facilities, uh, we do have a map view setting, uh, which essentially just uses uh, Google Maps. But what you can do is uh, where you place your sensors um, within this map view setting, you can actually go and then add uh, sensors within your HoboLink's map. And um, when you click on that map view, not only will it give you what its current reading is, it will actually show you the path that the signal's taking to get back to the RX unit. So in this illustration, as you can see, uh, in the center of this facility is where the RX station is located. And some of these sensors are connecting directly to it, where some of the other sensors out in what I'll call the left and right wings are actually passing their signal through uh, other sensors to get that signal back to the RX unit. Um, so essentially, this is just a good way to see what type of pass uh, your sensors are taking to get their data back uh, to the RX unit. And again, as well as just seeing what the current readings are. And what I'm going to do is actually just take a quick pause right here, and I would like to pull up some live data uh, from HoboLink, and that's actually my home weather station, uh, just to share with you to see how easy uh, HoboLink is to use. So when you log into HoboLink, and um, again, I should have prefaced, HoboLink is a free service we provide. So it's free to create an account. You just simply generate a username and password um, and then register any of your MX or RX devices on here. Um, so within here, you, uh, I'm actually under our RX devices right now. And as you can see, I have my home weather station on here. So you can simply just click on whatever station you want to monitor or look into. and um, the first option we have here is actually the overview section, which tells you, you know, what sensors you have connect to it, um, what their last reading was at time of connection. Uh, it gives you a connection strength indicator. So how strong of a signal does that wireless sensor have back to the, uh, the RX, as well as a battery status indicator. Um, and one nice thing about our sensors, is when, when you're configuring these, you can actually give them their own unique, unique names. So if you work using this in a large facility, um, you know, you can give these sensors names depending on where they're located on your facility, uh, just for, uh, you know, better file management or, or uh, ease of viewing that data. Also within our overview section, we do have a graphical section where you can view data in line graph form uh, for the past day, past week, or past month. Um, and again, each time it took a measurement, as you scroll over this line graph, uh, to the right-hand side of the line graph, you'll see where that data changes. So I have mine set to five-minute logging intervals. And as you move along here, it shows you when it took that reading and what that reading was. Um, this blue shaded area down here um, on the temperature sensor is actually an alarm I, that I have set. So I got an alarm set where once it gets close to freezing, um, I get a notification letting me know that it's got to the freezing point. Um, so on here, those are representative of uh, blue shadings. If you were to set the high alarm, you'd actually see that shading up top, but that would be in a red shading, letting you know that this is where the sensor had gone into a high threshold. You also have the ability to look at logs. So essentially right now, uh, this is what our connection log is. It's showing um, that it's made that it has made its connections at its uh, set connection interval. So for my station, I have a set where it pushes uh, data to the clouds every 10 minutes. And you can see that in the graph uh, along here, these are essentially 10 minutes apart. Um, and then also you can see alarm. So whenever a alarm was tripped, that is generated in this report, if um, a sensor has gone missing or the station had it connected, all those alarms will be set out, um, will be displayed out in here. And then lastly, we have uh, what we call an export uh, section. So you can either create a new export, where essentially you click on this, 
choose what sensors you want to be included in that report, and then it will generate either a CSV or XLS report. Or as I mentioned earlier, you do have the ability to uh, set up scheduled deliveries. So you could click on this, set, create a new delivery, choose how often you want this done, whether it's you know minutes, hours, days, weeks, and then um, it will deliver this data report at the set schedule, you know, on that reoccurring schedule. Um, another option uh, I want to show you, uh, which is uh, very convenient, is our dashboard section within Hoboling. So um, as I mentioned, you can choose multiple sensors from any data loggers that are sending data to Hobolink and have them grouped on here. Um, I have just a few of these set up now. Uh, but just to show you how easy it is to configure something like this, uh, you know, it's just a matter of going in, selecting edit your dashboard, and then you can choose a uh, new widget up here as to, you know, how you want to view that data. So for just sake of ease, let's choose latest conditions, which will give you um, a text data readout. Simply click on this, uh, choose what, what parameters you want to see in here. So I'm just going to be choosing from my home weather station right now. So we could do, you know, say pressure, relative humidity. Maybe we can include uh, this pool temperature and we'll do pool RH down here. And then we hit save. And now all that data is going to be saved down here. And now every time that uh, the RX pushes uh, data to the Hobo link, you will see these values change based off of that logging interval. And then if I, I hadn't mentioned earlier uh, with our stations, uh, the fastest that they can record data is once a minute, and the fastest that that data can be pushed uh, to the cloud is uh, 10 minute intervals. So while it's not real near uh, real time data, it's what we like to call uh, near real time data. All right, and let me just jump back over to the presentation real quick for us. Uh, so what we'd like to do now is uh, just take uh, a brief pause and ask another polling question, and it is, uh, what is your primary, primary application for data loggers? Excellent. So it looks like a majority of our attendees today are doing uh, indoor air quality and HVAC as well as energy projects. Um, a lot of times I see those actually go hand in hand. Uh, so we have indoor air quality and HVAC at 40%, energy at 37%. Uh, we have preservations in museums at 12%, uh, warehousing at 2%, and then 9% uh, for other. Uh, so if those others wouldn't mind maybe uh, just mentioning what their uh, data logging within the chat section, that would be very helpful. And maybe we can touch base on uh, those applications in a future presentation. So now that we've learned a little bit about data loggers, uh, what I'd like to do is just go over some uh, fre frequently asked uh, application questions when it comes to uh, indoor um, data logging. So one common question we get is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have two types of uh, remote monitoring systems, um, the Bluetooth data loggers with the gateway and then our RX station. What's the difference between those two? Um, essentially, our MX Bluetooth data loggers and the gateway form what we call a star network. So data only goes to the gateway, and the gateway must be centrally located within that 100 feet line of sight in order for the gateway to be able to pick up the data from those loggers. And again, up to 100 data loggers can connect to a single gateway. Whereas our uh, HoboNet 
uh, wireless sensor network forms what we call a mesh network. Um, and these, these sensors can transmit and receive data and alerts. So again, if a sensor is out of range or out of line from the RX, those signals can get passed through other sensors in line, making up to five hops. This essentially uh, extends your network range for large facilities. So if you know you're working in like a you know a seventy thousand square foot warehouse that may be you know one or two floors, uh, something like this would be um, more beneficial than going uh, with uh, the Bluetooth data loggers and gateway. Well, that would still work. Essentially, what it means is you may have to require running multiple gateways to be able to get all those Bluetooth data loggers. Uh, to connect to the cloud. Um, with a mesh network, the station doesn't have to be centrally located, uh, but it is ideal to have it centrally located. Um, just because uh, it can cause a little bit more strain on the batteries if uh, other sensors in line are constantly uh, getting signals from uh, sensors acting as a repeater and pushing that data along. Um, you know, again, you, you, with our rechargeable batteries that go on these, you should get a few years out of these. With the AA batteries, um, you will get about a year's life out of them before they would need to be uh, replaced. And uh, another common question that comes up is uh, any tips for monitoring, uh, you know, crawl spaces, attics, you know, more specifically, how many data loggers do I need and where would I need to place them? Um, and, you know, this is more for residential homes, but this can be applied uh, to facilities as well. And really, um, with our data loggers, they do take a localized reading. So really, you want to place the data logger um, where you want to take uh, this measurement. And essentially, it really depends on the space and what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, most of our data loggers, as a general rule of thumb, can cover up to 2,500 square feet. Keep in mind that would be, uh, you know, a wide open square feet. Anytime you start putting walls or obstructions in the way, uh, that can affect it. Also, uh, you know, within that 2,500 square foot, do you have uh, an H HVAC vent on one side of the area, but no ventilation on the other side of the area? You know, essentially that you're gonna, you could get two different readings uh, from one side of the space over to the other side of the space. Um, so for an example like this in this house, really due to its size, you could probably get away with just using, uh, you know, one data logger per location to get a better understanding of uh, what's going on in these spaces. Um, if you really want to get into the finer details, you could always place, you know, a couple data loggers uh, within each of these rooms just to get a better understanding, you know, is, you know, the south facing side of the house warmer or cooler versus the north side uh, facing of the house. Um, and then also, you know, is there any windows that would be causing more direct sunlight to come in versus another area that doesn't have windows and not allowing sunlight to come in? Um, in regards to if you're trying to monitor the functionality of your HVAC system, whether it's residential or commercial, uh, we always recommend placing a data logger at the thermostat. Your thermostat is what's triggering your HVAC system to come on and off. So recording data there is going to give you uh, you know, a, a better information on how efficiently uh, your HVAC system is working and is your thermostat um, triggering the, the system to turn on and off uh, when it should. Following up on that into more of a uh, commercial setting, uh, how is 2,500 square foot uh, suggested applied to office spaces or larger facilities? And again, as we mentioned for residential, um, same kind of applies to office space with this as well. Um, with this example in this picture, the office space is wide open, uh, but you can see that there is ceiling vents and there are uh, large windows along here. So at a minimum, you probably want at least uh, one data logger um, to be near the thermostat control. And really, if you're getting any specific complaints uh, within this area, you know, maybe placing a data logger there to see what the temperature and relative humidity readings are at the thermostat versus, you know, what the temperature readings are versus, um, you know, where your colleague or coworker is, um, 
experience, you know, either it being too hot or too cold. Uh, so for example, uh, one of my colleagues, Eileen, uh, was always complaining that uh, it's cold because the air conditioned vents uh, were blowing directly on her. And then during the winter, she could feel cold at her desk uh, because where, we, where she was sitting was on a cement floor with some carpet over it. And it was against an outside uh, cement wall. So essentially what we did is place a data logger at a thermostat there, um, and then placed a data logger right at her desk, her desk. And we essentially saw a three to four degree difference from where her desk was uh, to uh, where the thermostat was. So data can change drastically depending um, you know, on where you place the data logger and again, where your HVAC vents are located throughout your facility. So how does this 2,500 square foot suggestion get applied to uh, office spaces or large facilities? Uh, many large facilities obviously uh, are usually partitioned off and have multiple rooms um, in there. And this is where it can get a, you know, a little bit trickier where you know, instead of placing one data logger for, uh, per 2,500 square foot, you may need to place uh, several data loggers within that area just due to partitions being within that room. Um, also, you know, where are your HVAC vents located? Is it, are they all just on one side of the facility or are they spread out throughout the whole facility? And then again, uh, for sunlight, cause that can uh, affect uh, temperature. Um, is the sun just hitting one side of the building versus hitting, you know, and not hitting the other side of the building? Um, a lot of those things can uh, uh, play into what type of readings you're getting uh, throughout these areas. Um, and again, it can kind of help uh, plan for uh, better um, HVAC uh, deployment if you need to upgrade your system. It may require you to, you know, maybe have a few different, uh, a few additional vents or uh, separate out the zones a little bit better so you can make sure everyone uh, within the facility is comfortable. So another common question that we get is how to best log in air quality information, you know, sampling, data dumping, and more specifically, if you wanted to send preset data loggers out to clients um, to deploy them, what's the best process for this? So with our data loggers, uh, you do have the ability to set them up beforehand before you ship them out, where when you're configuring the, log the data logger, uh, you can't set up the logging interval, i.e. how frequently it's going to take that reading um, as well as setting up a delayed start and stop time or you could set it for a push button start so essentially uh, you know when you send this to your client uh, they could just deploy it it could start logging when you had programmed it to start or stop or you could just include instructions that when you get the data logger hit the start button and then it'll start logging at that point um, they, once they're done logging the data, they can simply send it back to you, um, regardless if the data logger is still running or not. Um, if you have a delayed stop time, obviously the data logger would stop recording at that time. And then essentially, once you get the data logger back, you simply offload the data um, from the logger, and then you'll be able to analyze that data for them. Um, and again, with our uh, Bluetooth data loggers, uh, they could always download our free uh, Hobo Connect app, offload the data themselves, and then just email you that data file. So um, a lot of times monitoring uh, indoor uh, parameters does require taking outdoor measurements just to see how the two uh, correlate with each other. So not only does OTS offer a wide array of data loggers for monitoring indoor applications, we also have solutions for monitoring outdoor and other water applications as well. And essentially, we just like indoor, we have some standalone data loggers. We do have outdoor weather stations, um, as well as water quality data loggers. Um, you know, again, sometimes it's nice to monitor, you know, outdoor parameters as well as if you're monitoring indoor parameters, just to you know be able to correlate. Well, if it's cold outside, is my HVAC system up, uh, functioning properly, or is it working too hard, or vice versa? In the summertime, is it when it's really hot outside? How hard is my air conditioning? Uh, unit having to work for that. So essentially we have a solution uh, for monitoring both indoor and outdoor applications. 
Um, another question that we uh, get a lot is best practices for uh, connecting current sensors, you know, to uh, air compressors or HVAC systems, and how to apply this data to uh, in, uh, data loggers to industrial mach uh, machinery, and then be able to uh, monitor uh, runtime of equipment. Uh, the most common loggers are that uh, people use for these were the uh, Hobo UX120006. M4 channel data logger, or now we have our new Bluetooth version of this data logger that does allow you to connect current transformers to it. And then we also have our UX90 uh, motor on and off data logger or state data logger. Um, and then this, this illustration down here shows you what a simple deployment would be. Um, you could connect uh, temp temperature sensors to your supply air, your return air, and then also monitor the current um, on the compressor itself, uh, just to get a better idea of how your system is running. And then also we have the ability to run it, uh, monitor uh, the runtime of that compressor pump as well with our UX90 uh, motor on and off data logger, which again, you simply just uh, magnetize it to the motor casing and it will record every time that motor comes on and off and uh, be able to give you a total runtime um, during its uh, deployment. Another popular question is uh, affordable uh, short-term and actually uh, long-term deployments for uh, trending energy usage, uh, usage and then also be able to get um, email alerts uh, when your on-demand KW or KV has reached uh, a certain level. Uh, one of our most cost-effective options for this is our Wattnode KWH transducer. Uh, this outputs um, a pulse output, so you can't connect it to any of our data loggers that uh, record a pulse signal. This can be used on single, split-face, or three-phase systems. And with our standalone USB data logger, we have packages starting at $426. Again, this will just give you kilowatt or kilowatt hours data. Uh, we also have our EG4100 series um, power meters. These do have um, a built-in web server, so when you connect it to the internet with either an Ethernet or a USB to Wi-Fi adapter, you will be able to log directly into uh, the built-in server uh, to get real-time data, uh, as well as be able to uh, export out historical data. These are offered in 15 or 30 channel um, uh, inputs, and these can record single, split, or three-phase and uh, with these, these essentially will uh, be able to capture any type of uh, energy parameter uh, you're looking to record. Um, and these are um, especially great for if you're doing any type of um, submeter applications. Um, and these particular devices, I just realized there is a typo on here. These particular devices, I believe the starting price point of these now is uh, $799. Um, and actually, one other thing I want to touch base with on uh, the Watt node over here is uh, you can actually connect this uh, if you needed a remote access to this data and wanted to set remote alarms um, when you reach a specific amount of kilowatt or kilowatt hours used. Uh, you can use either our wired or wireless pulse input adapters connected to one of our remote monitoring stations. And then again, you'll have remote access to that data as well as the ability to set those remote alarm notifications. Um, another uh, common application that people have questions on is uh, water consumption, you know, specifically out in uh, the West and uh, Midwest areas. Um, and what's a good way for recording that? Um, we do sell a T-minol uh, uh, flow meter, which essentially uh, records GPM um, of water usage. These can get connected to either uh, one of our uh, standalone USB uh, pulse data loggers or uh, to a uh, pulse and put adapter sensor that you can connect to one of our remote monitoring uh, stations. They are configured to use with three quarter inch pipes, but you do have the ability to use a uh, step up and step down adapters to go either up to a one inch pipe or down to a, a half inch pipe. Um, and again, they are co uh, compatible with uh, both our USB data loggers as well as our remote monitoring stations. And then uh, uh, differential pressure has been something that comes up a lot, uh, specifically monitoring in trend rooms, um, as well as hospital settings. 
Uh, with that, we do sell a uh, differential pressure transducer that can get connected to any of our data loggers uh, that accept uh, the uh, DC voltage signal. Um, and essentially, these are uh, ideal um, in pharmaceutical or hospital applications, you know, during the times of COVID where they're trying to mitigate the spread of diseases. Essentially, you'd want to keep negative uh, pressure inside of the patient's room to ensure that, you know, uh, you're not having any type of um, infectious uh, air uh, leave the room. And then also, um, you know, from like a, a pharmaceutical uh, or clean room standpoint, you want to keep that uh, pressure uh, at a positive setting so you're not getting any unfiltered or untreated treated air uh, coming into your clean room or, um, you know, where you're manufacturing or packaging uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and again, uh, just like any, uh, a lot of our other devices, this can get connected to either our standalone data loggers uh, or to um, some of our remote monitoring stations. And then lastly, a lot of times people ask, uh, and especially those of you who have been using our data loggers uh, for quite some time, you know, you do have some of our auto models. Why should you consider uh, upgrading them? Um, you know the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, with our newer data loggers, we just give you much more convenient and easier ways to get your data. Um, we also have greater memory capacity and uh, more accurate data loggers from some of our previous models, and also the ability to uh, receive remote alarm notifications for auto range conditions, you know, with our Bluetooth and uh, remote monitoring station uh, data loggers. So from there, that actually brings it to the end of the presentation. Um, we did go over a little bit uh, on this, but I'll be more than happy to uh, uh, go through some of the questions that were asked and try to answer some of the ones uh, that uh, are pertinent to um, all of uh, our attendees here. So let's see here. So it looks like Alex had mentioned, uh, asked about which data logger is best for monitoring uh, KWH change. Um, with something like that, uh, a good cost-effective solution would be our kilowatt hours monitoring kit with the watt node that we had just mentioned um, a few slides ago. Um, and then also you would ask, are all of our data loggers available in Bluetooth? Uh, we are slowly working at that. Not all of our loggers are available in Bluetooth models, uh, but a good portion of them are available in um, Bluetooth options. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Mark, yep, good question here for you. When you say the data loggers have one year's worth of memory capability, isn't the data upload to the cloud? So in a sense, it's unlimited. Uh, so with our data loggers, it was a uh, uh, battery life was uh, what I was referencing to at least one year um, of life out of those batteries. And um, just to follow up on uh, the memory part of that, Yes, so with our data loggers, um, you do have the ability to either set them to go to wrap mode or stop when the memory fills. If you are having this data pushed to the cloud, you can set it to wrap mode, so it's constantly logging because, again, all that information is getting pushed up to the cloud. So essentially, that's where uh, it's getting stored. Okay, Paul had a question about calibration. Um, our sensors are built with precision parts, which are designed to operate uh, within the specifications outlined uh, in the muse user's manual. Um, they do experience very little drift, if any at all, over a year. Um, we do have the ability to perform uh, NIST certification on them just to verify their accuracy. But again, since they're built with precision parts, they cannot be recalibrated. So for some reason, a, a sensor was out outside of its accuracy spec, uh, you would need to uh, purchase a new sensor at that point. Um, but most of our data loggers, you know, if at all, you may, you may experience, you know, less than a percentage uh, of drift per year.
All right. And uh, looks like Daniel had, had asked a question uh, about uh, VOC or PM 2.5 data loggers. Uh, for um, VOCs, really the only options we have right now is uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but with that being said, if you came across uh, PM 2.5 or VOC meter, that output uh, one of the analog signals I mentioned earlier, such as uh, 4 to 20 milliamp um, or you know some type of DC voltage, you can connect it to many of our data loggers and remote monitoring stations and um, just set up the scaling of what that current of voltage uh, represents in regards to its measurement range. Um, Steve had a question about our tech support. We do have a tech support department that is available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, they are available uh, through phone, uh, email, or you can also um, initiate an online chat through our website. All right. And we have run a few minutes over, so what I'm going to do is just keep this slide up for a little bit. Uh, this does have all of my contact information, so uh, anyone who had more specific questions, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy uh, to answer those for you. Um, and again, uh, just to follow up on our technical support department, um, I do have their information up there as well uh, with their hours, their phone number, and their email address. And um, yeah, I just want to uh, thank everyone for taking the time uh, to attend our webinar. I hope you found it useful. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, with any questions or concerns. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.